One of the great errors of the past has been to establish the meaning of the holy days as a doctrine of the church. And as a result of that, having established it as a doctrine, it's almost impossible to explore outside of the boundaries of that doctrine of what the holy day means and to be able to get into all the nuances of it. I think really that the observance of the holy days as such deserves to be a doctrine of any church of God, that we, this is a part of our fundamentals, of our basis. We definitely believe that for obedience to God, one must keep the holy days. But the passage of Scripture, I mean, the Scripture that tells us about the holy days said, these are the holy days of God that you will proclaim in their seasons. What it basically says is you'll preach them in their time. And the fact of the matter is that biblical typology is really not all that simple. And for you to come along and say, well, Passover means this, the Days of Unleavened Bread mean that, Pentecost stands for this, Trumpet stands for that, and just nail them all down and, and, and write them all up and seal them and have this is what the church believes and always will believe regarding the Holy Days, I think is very narrow-minded, in fact. And that there is a, a typology, a very rich typology, and I'll stop and explain that typology means a study of the types or of the models or of the symbolism that surrounds prophecy, the holy days, and of course the holy days are very prophetic in their outlook because they are an outline really of the plan of God, of what he is actually doing here on earth. And there are hints about that plan that crop up in these holy days, some of which I don't think we have adequately explored. Now, we know that prophecy, a given prophecy, can have two or more fulfillments. Why we would not assume then that a holy day might have two or more uh, types or symbols connected with it or have to do with different aspects of God's plan and of what God is doing. More and more as time has come by, we have come to realize that there is a, some of the symbol, the Holy Days have a peculiar symbolism for Israel that is not necessarily the same as the symbolism for all mankind. For example, when God told Israel, you will dwell in booths for seven days, all of you who are Israelite born, you will dwell in booths because I caused you to dwell in booths when you came out of the land of Egypt. Now, when it says in Zechariah 14 that the Egyptians are going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, it is a stretch to say that the typology for the Egyptians will be precisely the same as it was for Israel. The Egyptians, therefore, will dwell in booths for seven days because the Lord made them to dwell in booths when they came out of the land of Egypt and you follow me? That then there will be a significance to the Feast of Tabernacles for Egypt that is really a basic fundamental meaning of the Feast of Tabernacles for all men. And that there is a special meaning for the house of Israel because of their peculiar history and the things that they went through. So there are at least two meanings of the Feast of Tabernacles and perhaps there may yet turn out to be more than that as we study them. We know that this, this difference exists. And because of the lingering tendency to think of God as the God of the Jews, or as a Jewish God, or as the religion of the worship of God as Judaism before Christ came along, because of the rather lingering tendency to think of that way, I think sometimes we take too narrow a view of God and His plan as in fact the Syrians have done on more than one occasion. The Syrians, the people to the north of Israel, north and slightly to the east. There was an occasion in Old Testament times when they had fought against Israel on several occasions without very much success. In fact, the Syrians never have had a whole lot of success against Israel. But anyway, the Syrians had, had fought against them and fought against them and fought against them. And there's this little passage back in 1 Kings. You don't need to turn to it. It's just one verse. Verse Kings 20 and verse 23, it says this, The servants of the king of Syria said to him, Look, their gods are the gods of the hills, and therefore they were stronger than us in this last battle because we were fighting in the hills. Let's fight against them in the plain, and surely we will be stronger with them in the plain. Now, if you just understand that people tend to think of gods as being national gods, and the Syrians, we have our gods, and our God in the hills will be weaker than the Israelites' God. But in the plain, we'll be stronger, because we're a people, and our God is a God of the plain. So they went and fought them in the plain, and lost terribly. 
The lesson was, of course, God, I'm sure, was not impressed with the challenge. Well, you're only the God of the hills. We'll fight you in the plains and we'll beat you there. God says, no, the whole world has got to learn that God is the God of the whole world, not just of the Jews, not just of Israel, not just of any peoples, but of all men everywhere all the time. Unfortunately, I think even the New Testament writers, because they themselves were Jews, had a tendency, at least in the early time, to think in a lot the same way and had a hard time really breaking out of it and understanding what it was that, that, that they needed to understand. Even now today, I find a lot of people have a tendency to think that the, the secret, that the real secret of coming to know and to understand God is to approach God from Judaism. Making the mistake, I think, in some cases of confusing the Jewish culture with the religion of the Old Testament, and it's not the same. I'm sorry, it's not the same. And if you're going to view and come to know and understand God, you have to reach out beyond the Jewish culture and the Jewish understanding of God because it is narrow and specific and very oriented toward their own nation and their own history, which is understandable for them. But if you're going to really understand God, you have to break out of that narrow view. And if you're going to study his plan, then we have to take a much, much broader view than that. Now, among the Jews, appropriately, I think, it was always customary to read from the scriptures when they assembled. And they, in their tradition, had certain scriptures that were supposed to be read on certain Sabbaths of the year. And we don't follow a tradition quite like that, because when you come here, all of you bring a Bible and you have had the capacity all week long to read that Bible. And you could have read it every night during the week. You could have read it this morning. Uh, you, your wife could have read to you as you were driving to work here. I mean, driving to church here. You could know all there was to know. I mean, about the Bible, you've got your own. But in olden times, it wasn't that way. Uh, having a, even a portion of the Bible was a very expensive and a very difficult thing. And many people, you know, might not have been able to read it had they had it. And so consequently, the reading of the scriptures is they would go to the place where they kept the, the scrolls and they would bring the scrolls out. And I, I was really fascinated one night. I went to a bar mitzvah, the synagogue, and there was a place in it where they, they brought the, the scrolls out and they, everybody stands and then they take the scrolls and they hold them up before the people. And the scroll is sometimes paraded around the synagogue almost. And, you know, I can't, I hate to make this comparison in a way, but it really reminded me of the way in which a little statue of the Madonna might be carried around in a Roman Catholic possession, pr procession that she is exalted or the law is exalted. And as I explained, well, actually, I think it was right here in this room not long ago, that the law is not king. God is king and that the law flows from him, not the other way around. I, w I was really struck by, I, I would never go so far as to say that the Jews in that synagogue idolized the law or made an idol out of the law, but the comparison between those who did was, was striking to me. But nevertheless, the honoring of the law, standing up when the law was read, the, the, the reverence for the law of God and the word of God, I think is very important. But as I said, it was customary to read from the scriptures when they assembled, and on certain days they would read certain scriptures. Now, I do not know what their readings were on the Feast of Trumpets or any of the other holy days for that matter. I have never particularly studied that. Uh, there was no particular need for me to do so because as I approach the Bible with concordance and nowadays with a computer that, that will find what I need, to find scriptures that could be read for holy days, uh, there's no difficulty whatsoever. And so I think we might oftentimes choose our own. What may not be realized by many people is that the custom was that someone would stand and read from the scriptures, then the scroll would be closed, and then they would comment on or talk about the scriptures, which is really not very far at all from what we do in a sermon. We have a facility, I think, in the ability to go from place to place in the scriptures that they may not have had because of the way in which our scriptures are indexed. If I say Isaiah 5, 8, you can go straight to Isaiah 5, 8 in your Bible, and we can be talking about the same thing almost instantly. This is not so easy. When you have one scroll in the synagogue and it is read aloud for you and then we make our homily or our sermon from that one scroll that we hold out before you. Well, it's common, as I said, to read and to comment on the reading. And we have, while we have not had a specific list of scriptures to be read on the holy days, 
We do know that they are to be proclaimed in their seasons. In my own case now, for all over 35 years, I was taught right from the very beginning when I came into the ministry, you're supposed to preach the meaning of the day on the day. And so traditionally, I have always gone to certain scriptures, have read those scriptures, and have commented on those scriptures to the, to the churches where I have taught, and consequently have really uh, immersed myself for year after year in the typology of the Holy Days. And I have found it a very enriching experience. We don't have to always, let's say, restrict ourselves to the typology of the Holy Days, but we can explore analogies and figures of speech. We can explore, explore history. We can go into prophecy, for there is much of that connected with all of these Holy Days. Well, in this particular one, Leviticus 23, 23, is the passage of Scripture, let's say, that we would start with as our reading for this day. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now, I've always, always found this particular short little passage rather, rather fascinating and rather puzzling as well. Now, from what we know about the Holy Days, when we approach this Leviticus 23, which lays out all the Holy Days, they're right there for you to look all the way through them all. The first and the last of them, that is the, not quite the last, but the Passover and the Days of Unleavened, sorry, the Days of Unleavened Bread for the spring, and then the Feast of Tabernacles in the autumn. All of us know that both of these holidays, or Holy Days, have profound historical connection to Israel's, you know, to their history, to their life as a people. The exodus out of Egypt that's involved in the one, and of course the wilderness wanderings that's involved in, in tabernacles and living in Booth, both of them had very strongly to do with their origins as a nation, how they were separated from Egypt, how they were brought on up to Israel, and the temporary nature of their existence in tabernacles through the wilderness wanderings till finally they came into the land. Those two are very, those two are extremely uh, historic. The rest of them, though, have next to nothing to do with Israel's history, and I don't know if you've ever thought about that. People look at them as Israel's holy days, and they're prone to want to connect them to Israel's history. But what historical event is specifically in the Bible attached to Pentecost? I know traditionally the giving of the law what took place on Pentecost, but you'll, I'll defy you to find a place in the Bible where it says that on the, you know, six, you know, they counted so many days, it was the Feast of Pentecost, and God came down on Mount Sinai and gave Moses the law. It's not in there. I think it probably did. But the, the historical connection for Pentecost is really very tenuous. The Day of Atonement, as far as I know, has no historical connection whatsoever. There's no event in Israel's history that is symbolized by the Day of Atonement at all. Uh, it, however, has profound ceremonial and prophetic significance. And, of course, this lengthy ceremony of the Day of Atonement that you find described in Leviticus 17 is really fascinating as to what had to be done, how the priest had to go in and do this and all the things that were done. They fasted on that day. So it, it had a lot connected with it, as Pentecost had quite a bit connected with it. But when you come to the Feast of Trumpets, this is all there is. There is no historical connection that is defined for the Feast of Trumpets. It, does, it isn't tagged to an event, to some circumstance. And as far as ceremony connected with, the, with, the, with this day that's above and beyond all the other days, there is one distinguishing ceremony, and that's all. What's that? Blow the trumpet. You put the trumpet to the lips and blow. That is the totality of the unique ceremony to this day. And it is unique because I don't, well, I'm sorry, it's not totally unique because the trumpet is also blown on the Day of Atonement. And I think that uh, uh, there is no other holy day other than atonement and trumpets upon which a trumpet is blown. Now, what's odd about this, you might ask, because I did say in a bit that, that it's kind of strange, it's different in this way. One thing that's odd about it is that there is no word for trumpet in that passage of Scripture that I just read to you. There shall be a memorial a blowing of trumpets. There's no word for trumpet there. There are two words primarily translated pr trumpet throughout the Old Testament. I'll talk about them in a moment. Uh, up to four words that are, but really only two that are significant. 
Not one of those words is found in there. It is understood. It basically says, there shall be for you a memorial of blowing. Now, the presumption is upon something that you blow into to create a sound. I mean, that's okay. And I think the, the translation is quite all right. A memorial of the blowing of trumpets, because we do need to understand that, that that's about all there was for them to blow on. There were, however, two distinct kinds a trumpet, which I think is not all that widely understood. There were two different instruments entirely that they might have been, been blown. Now, as I've already said, there were only two places in the law. Where, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I don't think I said this before, but there are only two places in the law where the Feast of T Trumpets is commanded. And in neither place is the word for trumpet is in the text, which I think that is really very striking. The uh, other one, I think, is, uh, is uh, Numbers 29.1. In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets, and trumpets is understood unto you. It's not in the Hebrew at all. Now, by the time the Psalms was written, a horn had been designated for this day. In Psalm 81, verse 3, in the King James Version, it reads this way, Blow up the trumpet in the new moon in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. Now, the word trumpet here is one you probably have heard before, is shofar. The shofar basically means a curved horn. It is often presumed to be a ram's horn, but I don't know that that is necessarily the case. Uh, it may well be that it also could have been made of metal uh, and a curved horn, because in many places the word shofar in the Bible is translated cornet. And it's also translated as trumpet, by the way. It's translated as trumpet and cornet. And I don't know if it's translated as horn or ram's horn or not. I wasn't looking that up uh, for today. This says, blow up the trumpet in the new moon in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. Now, as far as I know, there is absolutely only, there is only one feast day in the year, and I do know, that begins on a new moon. What's that? This is it, today. So when it says, blow the shofar, on the day of the new moon is in, in the solemn feast day, it has to be talking about this. And so finally we get an instrument connected with the blowing that takes place on this day, but we get it all the way down in the Psalms. It's not in the Torah whatsoever. Why not? Well, because, probably because the choice of instrument was not significant. I have pondered in the, in, the, in the past whether or not the instrument that was blown on trumpets was, that, was the shofar or whether it was the silver trumpets made of metal that were blown by the priest, which is a totally uh, different name from this one. Now, the, the, new, the NIV translation has on this, in the time appointed, I'm sorry, I think I made, I made a mistake in my notes here. Yeah, the NIV translates the, the phrase, in the time appointed, that we have here, which means basically fullness, as, and at the full moon. In other words, the NIV would read something like, uh, blow up the trumpet in the new moon, in fact, I think what it says is, blow up the trumpet in the new moon and at the full moon uh, and on our solemn feast day. The implication of this is that it also was blown on the full moon. However, uh, the word that is translated as full moon by NIV and uh, RS, New Revised Standard and several others here is actually, doesn't have, it's not the word for moon. Moon is not here. It's a word which basically means fullness or plump from which they assume that they're saying in the new moon and in the plumpness or fullness of the moon that is developed. It seems to me that it would be just as easily, if you're going to make a, a, an assumption here to say, blow up the trumpet in the new moon in the fullness of time in our feast day, as opposed to assuming that there's a, new, a full moon that gets involved in this, as NIV does. I prefer blow up the trumpet in the new moon at the fullness of time on our solemn feast day. Now, I do not recall any instructions, as I said, for blowing trumpets except at the Feast of Trumpets and on the Day of Atonement. Now, there's an intriguing ambiguity about this in the Old Testament. There are only two main words translated as trumpet, and they stand for two distinct instruments. Now, you're already familiar with, with shofar. It's when you uh, see, I think, in the uh, movie The Ten Commandments, they have this great ram's horn. They say, blow on a ram's horn. That's a shofar, and it is basically a curved instrument that it was always a ram's horn, that is, a, the, an animal's horn, I, I am not certain. I think that there, it's possible it was a different kind of, of metal instrument as well, because it is translated as cornet as well. The other word, Hebrew word, is chatzatzara, 
Now, don't try to write that one down. I, I, some Hebrew words, by the way, are actually chosen because they match the sound matches the uh, item that you want to talk about, or they are descriptive in that way. And one wonders if it's because of the sound that a trumpet made that they call it a chatzatzara. You know, like uh, you might call it a to-do, to do if you're in England today, or in English today. Uh, if you'll turn back to Numbers 10, I want to show you that particular il illustration of that. Numbers, the 10th chapter, where it talks about these trumpets. And presumably, these could be trumpets that were blown on, on this festival, but not necessarily. Uh, oops, I'm in the wrong place. In the wrong book. Numbers chapter 10. Somehow I made myself to the other end of the Old Testament. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make you two trumpets, chachatzerah, of silver. Of a whole piece shall you make them. What you may, so you can use them for the calling of the assembly, for the journeying of the camps. And this was the, uh, the kind of a, a, a jarring note, in a way, of some of the, of some of the uh, Bible movies that I've seen, is that they called the assembly or the moving of the camps by blowing a shofar, ram's horn. Whereas, in fact, the silver trumpets were the ones designed for this purpose. Wonder why? Not a difficult thought. The fact is that silver trumpets probably would be heard over a longer distance than the more mellow, curved ram's horn or cornet, as they are sometimes called. When they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to you at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. If they blow one trumpet, then the princes who are the heads of the thousands of Israel shall gather to you. When you blow an alarm... Then the camps that lie on the east part shall go forward. When you blow the alarm the second time, the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. Now, this is really interesting, because apparently a solid blast was, a, was a, uh, an officer's call. I had kind of forgotten that, but when I was in the military, there was a whole set of different bugle calls. There was officer's call, there was to the colors, there was taps, there was reveille, there was... Uh, chow call, you know, mess hall, where you were called to the mess hall to eat. And we all learned very quickly what the different calls meant. Now, in the modern Navy, they would blow the trumpet over the, uh, you know, put that particular sound over the sound system, and then somebody would come along and tell you what it meant, which made life a lot easier, you know, as far as that's concerned. But when I went through boot camp in the Navy, we had to learn all those particular calls. And I think everybody here knows the difference between taps and reveille, right? We know that there is a sound that a trumpet or, a, in this particular bugle, could make, which tells us that it's time to go to bed or it's time to get up. Uh, the same thing would be th true of, of, to the colors. Uh, we all learn that one so that we know that when it's being played, you stop, turn, and salute toward the flag or stand facing it at least. And to realize that the fl flag is being raised or coming down at, at the evening. See, is it the same call? I don't, don't recall exactly. Uh, but all these calls are different. Well, Israel had this as well. They had the silver trumpets upon which, you know, with a ram's horn, it's just blat, and that's about all you can do with the thing. But I gather with the silver trumpets, they were able to create a, a, a call for the princes. Then they were to give a different call, which was an alarm, as they called it, which I, don't, I think the word alarm in the sense of uh, scaring somebody is not necessarily what's meant, but just an alert that when you blow this, this particular sound, it's not for the princes to come in, it's for the camps to eat, for, on the east to go. And when you blow this sound for the second time, it's for the camps on the west to go. So they used the trumpet because the trumpet could be made to give distinctions in the sounds to send messages over a very wide area. And that the silver trumpet, I have little doubt, was much better suited to that than was the old shofar or ram's horn that they might otherwise have used for that. You remember in, in, in the 14th chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians when Paul is talking about speaking in tongues? And he's very concerned about the fact that people are up here blabbing in front of the congregation and the congregation doesn't know what they're talking about. And he says, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who will prepare himself to battle? You've got to give a distinction in the sounds. You don't know what you're doing if you don't do that. So he drew this particular analogy. So the trumpet should give a distinct sound and one that people would recognize and know. So there are two distinct in instruments. Now, if you'll turn back, actually, you don't really need to turn back there. I'm not going to read much, just the verse in question. Uh, first, Second Chronicles 15 and 14, it says, They swore unto the Lord with a loud voice, and with shouting, and with trumpets, and with cornets. The word cornets is shofar. 
The word for trumpets is chatsatsara. So it is the, diff- the other word for the silver trumpet that they made. So two completely different instruments. In uh, Hosea 5 and verse 8, blow you the, tr- the cornet in Gibeah and the trumpet in Ramah. Cry aloud at Beth Havan after you, O Benjamin. So here are these musical instruments, music, using the word music in a very broad sense, I think, that were used for signaling Israel as to what they were going to do. But the law says nothing about which of these instruments we should blow, which should suggest that it might not matter very much. And also it says that it is a memorial of the blowing of trumpets in the plural, which might very well suggest that you're blowing just about everything that makes a noise when the time comes for this day to come, come around. Now, the most, as I said earlier, though, that one of the most intriguing aspects of this is that there does not appear to be any historical symbolism in connection with the festival. And uh, that, I think, is significant. Uh, trumpets has nothing except blowing, and so all we can do is read and study and ponder it. Now, in the New Testament, we have one word for trumpet. There is no distinction to be made whatsoever. I don't even remember what it is. It's not particularly important because everywhere you see trumpet or trumpets or some version of it in the New Testament, it's that word. Only one. Old Testament Israel, and I I have a feeling, though, that if you were to look in the uh, Septuagint, wherever you find the word shofar, you probably would find the New Testament or Greek word for trumpet that you find there. I expect that that comparison would be much stronger there. Now, the Old Testament seems to have had no historical typology for this holy day. So we have to draw what we can from the prophets and from the New Testament. So let's just do a few readings and discussions on this today. If you'll turn back to Isaiah chapter 27. Isaiah chapter 27. Try to see if we can pull together for ourselves some typology for this particular holy day. In Isaiah 27... In that day, the Lord, with his sore and great and, and great and strong sword, shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent. He shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. The symbolism that starts getting down toward the destruction of the devil, the destruction of the devil's system, and of those nations that are led by the devil. And he makes quite a bit of these prophecies through. And it comes down in verse 27, I'm sorry, verse 12, to say this. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off which means to thresh, actually, you, as you would have uh, grain head, with heads of grain, you would actually beat them with a stick and beat the heads of grain loose from the stalk. The Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river to the stream of Egypt, and you shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. Now, I won't take the time today to try to fill in all of the background of Isaiah around this. I will leave it you the pleasure of studying this section in so you'll know exactly where you are. But the fact of the matter is that what he is talking about here is a time in the future when Israel has gone into captivity again. And now he's talking about the fact that he's going to go through in Assyria and Egypt both and systematically separate Israel from the people they're they're in captivity with and begin to gather them back again into Israel. Now, understanding that particular point, we will begin to grasp that we're at the end time that God is going to be bringing Israel back in. And there's the point in time is there will be a great trumpet blown And those people who were ready to perish in captivity will be brought back into the land. Now, when you look at the layout of all these holy days in Leviticus 23, the Feast of Trumpets falls just 10 days before the Day of Atonement, which we have in the past assumed has chronological significance. I want to caution you against taking chronological significance and just trying to run the holy days this way. But on the other hand, there's no reason to ignore it either. And we have traditionally said that the Feast of Trumpets pictures the return of Christ, the Day of Atonement pictures the binding of Satan, an event which will take place after the return of Christ. So here in this Old Testament prophecy, we have not merely any trumpet, but the 
great trumpet, whatever that would be. Now, if there is one that is called the great trumpet, does that suggest anything to you? Does it suggest that there might be other trumpets besides the great trumpet? And which of the great trumpets do you suppose this would be? Or, I mean, how, which trumpets are we talking about? What could it possibly be? Well, we're connected right to the very end time. We're re connected to the return of captives back to Israel again at the very end time, which a lot of other prophecies suggest to us takes place at the return of Christ. So there's something to draw from that. Now, if you turn back to Jeremiah, the fourth chapter, just to take a look at what other prophets might say about these days, Jeremiah chapter 4. And I think I begin reading in verse 19. My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot make, hold my peace. What he's saying is, all my insides are in a knot. I am torn up over this thing. I can't hold my peace because you have heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet the alarm of war. Now, this particular statement is, is consistent, and you'll also find if you take a look at Ezekiel 33, I won't turn there for you, but in Ezekiel 33, verse, verse 3, it's talking about the watchman that is on the wall. And you say, if you the people set a watchman on the wall, and the watchman looks out across, and he sees the enemy coming. If, it says in verse 3, if when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blow with the trumpet and warn the people. In other words, the watchman is to see war coming and blow the trumpet and warn everybody. And the message in Ezekiel is if he does this and blows that trumpet and warns the people, then he rescues his own soul, depending upon whether they believe him or not. But that's their problem. He's warned them. So the trumpet is a warning of impending disaster. It's a warning of coming, coming war. And Jeremiah says, I, I, you know, when I'm, I'm here and all of a sudden the alarm is blown that there is an enemy approaching and in a city knowing the siege is coming and that your life is hanging in the balance. You can understand the imagery then of a man clutching himself in the middle and all of his insides beginning to churn over what is about to take place. This particular passage of Scripture starts tying up the, uh, the trumpets. This is not the great trumpet so much, but it's an alarm of a war that is about to descend upon a people. Now, I could spend more time in the Old Testament, but I don't have time today to kind of il illustrate how the trumpets were used and how that they do tend in the prophets. And by the way, uh, th I did, did my word study on this early this morning, and the computer is very handy in this regard. I was really struck by the fact that while it's not a, this is not an absolute distinction I want to draw for you, but in the main, the chatsatsara, silver trumpets, were used for the most part in celebration and, you know, that type of situation. But when you come to the prophets... And the prophets start talking about the warning from the wall, the warning of God, and, and all of their usage of trumpets are inevitably the shofar, that alarm that is to come. And of course, then in Psalm 81, verse 3, it is the shofar that is blown in connection with the holy day that falls on the new moon, which is this day. Now, these are all Old Testament scriptures, but I want to go back to the New Testament to see if we can't maybe take a forward-looking uh, approach to this particular day and look at some other scriptures that might help us to understand what this day might be about. In Matthew 24, and uh, I'll begin reading in verse 32. I'm sorry, no, I won't either. I'll begin in verse 9, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, Shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now, you remember about Matthew 24. This came about as a result of Jesus and the disciples walking about the temple, and the, the, all these country boys from Galilee pointing and ooing and awing over what they were seeing there. And Jesus, having listened to them for a while, said, I'm going to tell you the truth. The time is coming when there will not be one stone here on top of another, that has not been thrown down. And I think that probably put a little bit of a wet blanket on their enthusiasm. And when they got to another place, they said, okay, when is this going to happen? And what's going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Now, he has been telling them all manner of things. And he talks about a time called the Great Tribulation, a time which um, no one in his right mind should be looking forward to. 
And then he says in verse 39, after the tribulation of those days, heavenly signs are going to fall, follow. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give her light. The stars shall fall from the heaven and as in a great meteor shower. The powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the, in, in the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. The great blowing of a trumpet. And I don't know that this is the great trumpet, but in some ways it sounds very much like it. Look at what happens. He shall send his angels with the sound of the trumpet, and they shall gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. In type, it is Israel. Remember what he said, the great trumpet will be blown. God will take a threshing instrument and separate his people out and begin to bring them back into the land. Here, a great sound of a trumpet is blown. The angels are sent out and they gather his elect. Israel in type, church in antitype. And both those events are going to take place. Israel will be regathered into the land and the children of God will be brought, and those people in whom is the Spirit of God will be caught up to meet Christ in the air. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is still tender and puts forth his leaves, you know that summer is near. So likewise you, when you shall see all these things, all the events that are described in the 24th chapter of Matthew, which I haven't even touched on today, because I think most of you here know them and know them fairly well. When you begin to see these things take place, you will know that it is near. You will not know the day. You will not know the hour. But thanks be to God, we are not in darkness that we should be caught completely and absolutely unaware by these things. We should be responsive to the signs we see taking place around us. And we realize that between now and the time of the blowing of this trumpet, there is a time the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. A time of great trouble that there has not been on the face of the earth before that time, and there will never be another time like it afterward. One time, unique in all history, and it lies ahead of us now. It's funny. You know, I think that we in a 20th century perspective, can see how much worse things could be than what has happened, what, what anybody who originally, let's say, saw or knew or talked to Jesus or was there when he gave the prophecy. We are in a position, I think, to understand how much worse things can be than these men could ever have quite grasped. And somewhere between where we are now in history and the blowing of this trumpet, there is this, this great tribulation. And the great trumpet is blown at the return of Christ, at the gathering of the elect, at the resurrection of the dead, at the calling of bringing together of all of his people who are alive back together again. Turn to 1 Thessalonians, if you would. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4. Try to grasp the picture as much as we possibly can. Chapter 4, verse 13. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, who have died, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. Thessalonica was rather inter, uh, unique in this regard. The church had suffered enormous persecution since Paul had been there. Some people had died, and he was concerned that the church was mourning over much for these people. He says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For we say unto you by the word of the Lord, we who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not pre go before those who have died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. You know that trump of God is an interesting expression. For I told you that there were more than two words in the Old Testament that were translated trumpet. There is one time that the word trumpet is translated by, I forget the name of the Hebrew word, and I wouldn't, I mean, wouldn't embarrass myself by trying to pronounce it for you. It is at the moment when God came down upon Mount Sinai, and the mountain was all upon a smoke, and there was a sound of a great trumpet. That word is not shofar, it's not chachatzara, it's a different word altogether. The trump of God is not a silver trumpet, 
and it's not a ram's horn. So think about that one for a moment. That thing may be, you know, something beyond anything you and I are able to grasp. And maybe that's why this isn't the feast of uh, ram's horns or chatzat silver trumpets. That is a feast of the blasting of, a, of, of trumpets, meaning the trumpet of God, not just necessarily the trumps of us little old men. The voice of the archangel with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That is before we all go up. The dead in Christ shall rise. The blowing of the great trumpet involves the gathering of God's people alive and dead to Jesus Christ to meet him in the air. Even in type, as it symbolizes the gathering of Israel, those unconverted Israelites from the countries where they have gone into captivity, and to bring them back into the God's, God's own land, where he can be their shepherd, where David can reign over them, where they can come to worship him in spirit and in truth, and learn the things that they had managed not to learn prior to that time. In 1 Corinthians 15, the other very famous scripture that has to do with, with this, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul in this chapter has asked the question, or actually raised the question of the resurrection, the doctrine of the resurrection, because there were a couple of fellows in the church that had said, well, the resurrection's already passed. And Paul, or actually they had said in this case, I think that there was no resurrection at all. And Paul, absolutely dumbfounded by this, could, you know, says, well, now, how in the world, I mean, if, if, if Christ isn't raised, then the dead don't rise, and I'm mean, sorry, if the, if the dead aren't raised, then Christ didn't raise. Uh, rise from the dead, and your faith is vain. You're, you're still in your sins. He's, he just doesn't know what to say to these people. Now, he also comes to this point in verse 35 that somebody, he says, I know is going to ask this question. How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? And Paul, with his usual tact and diplomacy, says, you fool, that which you sow is not quickened except it die. And that which you sow, you don't sow what shall be, but bear grain. It may be wheat. It may be some other grain. But what you put in the ground is not what you're going to harvest. You need to understand this. You're going to have something totally new come up out of the ground. God will give it a body as it has pleased him. He goes on then to compare it to the, 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 the glory of a celestial body like the moon. He says, it's not like the glory of, a, of, the, of the sun which shines it's, which, with, its, with its own glory and its own brightness. He says that we are sown, I mean, the resurrection of the dead is like this. In verse 42, it is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. There is a spiritual body, he says. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. A last Adam, a life-giving spirit. And in verse 48, as are the earthy, such are they that are earthy. And, such is, and, and as is the heavenly, such is the, also they are that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I want to tell you this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. You can't go there. You can't have it. You can't be a part of it as long as you're physical. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. All of us aren't going to die. But we shall all be changed. When? In a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall I put on incorruption, and this mortal shall I put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? You've lost it. Those that you thought you had a hold on are gone. You know, you should have tumbled to this by now, but you've got more than one trumpet, right? because one of them is the great trumpet. Now he tells you that the great trumpet, as you might expect, is the last. Isn't that interesting? So if there is a last trumpet, there are trumpets before, right? 
Now, in all of the history, in biblical history, and in all of biblical prophecy, I really don't know myself of any, and I will, anybody who knows it can show it to me. I know of no place in the Bible where you can find a succession of trumpets with one at the end that is a great trumpet, except for the book of Revelation and the seven last trumpets. Do you? I mean, you can search Israel's history. There's nothing like it. You can search the Old Testament prophets, and there are hints that look forward. But the only place I know of where these trumpets are really, you know, laid out for you so you can see what's actually involved in them is beginning in the eighth chapter of Revelation. And I want to take you back there to look at these for any discussion or reading of scriptures, let's say, on the Day of Atonement with following discussion. I mean, Day of Atonement, I'm, what, what day is this? This is trumpets. Any discussion of this day has to come here. It says, when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given to him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came up with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. We really, at this point in time, find, us, find ourselves at a, a time of staggering trouble upon the face of the planet. For leading up until this time have been wars and rumors of wars and destructiveness of all kinds by man. But what you seem to find here is the culmination of all that destructiveness that is released finally to flow forth upon the earth. It is a time of trouble, the likes of which never has been before, it never would be again. The first angel sounded, and there was hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. On the whole planet? Well, the Great Tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble, so maybe it's not necessarily the whole planet, but it's enough. Can you imagine the destructiveness of this? A third part of all the trees was burnt up and the grass was burnt up. The whole patches of this earth that had been burnt right level with the ground. All the grass, all the trees, everything is utterly and completely gone in that area. And the second angel sounded and you know, that wasn't enough. And a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And a third part of the sea became blood. And a third part of the creatures that were in the sea and had life died. And a third part of the ships were destroyed. I think there is a lot of symbolism here. When it says a third part of the sea became blood, I don't think it necessarily means the red stuff that comes out of your veins. I think it means it became blood in the sense that everything in it was dead. Is what it means. Now, I don't know what this is. I, in my earliest, you know, wanderings through this and ponderings over it, I used to imagine somebody looking up and seeing a great mountain come out of the sky, maybe talking about a rocket uh, that came down with, with poison gas or nerve gas or nuclear weapons of this sort. And yet, in more recent years, you begin to hear people talk about the fact that this earth has been hit in the past by asteroids. And that the very, you know, there's this whole huge region in Siberia up there where everything at one time, and this has not been uh, back before man, this has been in the age of man. Everything was just flattened for who knows how many miles around. There is this incredible crater down there off the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, which they think that it was this kind of collision with a heavenly body that may very well have caused the uh, nuclear, or the, this, this case the asteroid winter, that led to the extinctions of, one, of some of the great creatures of the earth. Because you go into a period of time when so much debris has been cast into the earth that the sun is made black. Does that sound familiar? That the sun becomes dark and the moon's like sackcloth of hair? They say it's happened before. And as I was reading in one astronomical journal, it said, you know, one of the axioms of science is that which can happen will. That at some time, if it can happen, sooner or later, it will. And everybody knows that we have, at some point, as we keep rolling our way around the sun, as we keep making our way through this great universe, somewhere out there we have a rendezvous with one of those things again. So why should we marvel that it says, a great mountain burning with fire, which is exactly what the thing would be like, fell into the sea and killed a third of everything that was in the sea, which I think is not at all surprising 
considering what it would mean to have that kind of impact and the shock waves that would go out through the ocean as a result of that kind of impact. Man could do it, but God could do it a great deal more effectively than man. And the third angel sounded, sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning like a lamp, and it fell upon the, part of the, the third part of the rivers and the fountains of waters. And the name of that star is called Wormwood. Wormwood is a poison. And that does suggest some kind of human intervention and the possibility of the use of, of chemical weapons. And the third part of the waters became work. I, I, I'm not going to go through every aspect of all these trumpets because they, they, are, they can be terribly depressing and very frightening for the children but they, maybe the children do need to come to understand, A, that there are some terrible times ahead, but B, there is protection for them and their families and that there is a way that, that there's a new world on the other side of it. It says in verse 13, the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God saying to the sixth angel that had the trumpet, loose the four angels that are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which had been prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, to slay the third part of men. Kill a third of them. One third. Just tick them off. One in three. What's sobering about this, you go back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel has a prophecy. A prophecy that seems to be aimed at the end time. That says there's going to come a time when one third of them will be killed off by pestilence. One third of them killed off by war. And the remaining third of them taken into captivity. One third. Just chop, chop, chop. Come up here. One third of them die. And off they go, the remainder of them into captivity. So the trumpets talk about to us about terrible things, terrible disasters that can come upon this earth. And these terrible disasters seem to be the culmination of man's attempts to destroy himself. And God stepping into the scene to finally put a stop to all of it, which he does with the seven last plagues, which come later. Now you notice... If you have your Bible marked at all, you'll notice that 8 and 9 seem to finish with these trumpets. And there's the seventh one is not there. Now, we would not be paying attention, I think, if we did not assume that that seventh trumpet is the great one. It's the last one. The one also, which it said back in, the prophet, back in, in, in Paul's writings, it was the last trumpet at which the dead would be raised and come to Christ. In, in verse 15 of chapter 11, the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And right here is, are the words of one of the greatest pieces of music ever performed before people out of the Bible and set to music. is the Hallelujah Chorus you find in Handel's Messiah. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. What a great day that is. Because it's only here that the great destructions, the great loss of life can end. And the time can come when the dead shall rise and be found with God. And the four and twenty elders that sat before God on their seats upon, fell upon their faces and worshipped God saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which are and were and are to come. Because you have taken to you your great power and have reigned. Now the way this is worded, it seems to tell us that before a given point in time, God had not taken his great power to himself to reign. Isn't that interesting? We think, well, God's in heaven. God's in charge of everything. God's taking, you know, uh, God, God knows what's going on. He's in charge. Well, what this seems to say is there is a point in time where he, before which he has kind of kept hands off, voluntarily, not because he couldn't, and there comes a time when he takes his great power in hand, and then takes a hand and steps into the affairs of man. And the nations were angry, and your wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should give reward to your servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear your name, small and great, and should destroy them that destroy the earth. That little phrase, that you're going to take your power to you and reign. And then there's all this list of things that you're going to do and say the time has come that you should destroy them who destroy the earth, says it all. It really says for you what is going on here. That man has been given a lot of time 
And during that period of time, instead of building, he has destroyed. And that he, we are in grave danger, frankly, of man finally destroying the earth altogether. And I thought about that, and I thought about all the work that went into the creation of this planet upon which we live, of all the planning and of all the design work. And I'm afraid that sometimes we, in our human way, read the things, well, God said, let there be light, and there was light. See how easy that was for God. And God said, well, let there be fish, and let there be birds, and let there be all these things. These things are just popping up all over the place. Wait a minute. I don't think it was like that. I really think that what you have in the first chapter of Genesis is a song which in a poetic style describes the creation of God. But God, in his time, and his time is different from our time, deliberately planned this world in which you and I live and made it a beautiful thing. And at each step of his work, he looked around at all the work that he'd made and said, that is very good. And he went on to the next phase of it. He said, that is really good. And on and on he went. And every step of the way, it was, that's really good. And when all of it was said and done, God had to have taken great pleasure in it. And when you think of the beauty of the earth and the places you have seen, the places you have been and how gorgeous they are, and think of God having created this great garden place here, and then imagine how he feels at the destruction that has been brought upon it, the phrase, the time has come that you should destroy them that destroy the earth, has great meaning. This day, the Feast of Trumpets, actually looks to the time when those trumpets will be blown, and the great trumpet, and Christ shall appear, the dead in Christ shall rise, and all of us will be united with him. What a day.